Chapter 12 The Mirror of Erised A Reset Christmas was coming. One morning in mid-December, Hogwarts woke to find itself covered in several feet of snow. The lake froze solid and the wizard winds were punished for bewitching several snowballs so that they followed Quirrell around, bouncing off the back of his turban. The few owls that managed to battle their way through the stormy sky to deliver mail had to be nursed back to health by Hagrid before they could fly off again. Direkt şey anlamına geliyor yani. Quirrell'un türbanını düşürmek için kartopu atmaları Voldemort'u kartoplamaları anlamına geliyor. Bizde ikizlerinin bu olayı harika bir olay. Bu baya enteresan insanları sinirlendirip enteresan insanları kendi tarafına çekebiliyorlar. Beşinci kitapta göreceğiz. Peeves. Peeves mı? Peeves. Peeves desek daha doğru gibi geliyor. Peeves'i, Peeves'e diyorlar ki okul sana emanet bir sürü yaramazlık yapmaya devam et. Peeves bunları lafını dinliyor falan. Böyle ilginç olaylar oluyor. No one could wait for the holidays to start while the Gryffindor common room and the great hall had roaring fires. The drafty corridors had become icy and a bitter wind rattled the windows in the classrooms. Worst of all were Professor Snape's classes down in the dungeons, where their breath rose in a mist before them and they kept as close as possible to their hot cauldrons. I do feel so sorry, said Draco Malfoy in one portion's class, for all those people who have to stay at Hogwarts for Christmas because they're not wanted at home. He was looking over at Harry as he spoke. Crab and Boyle chuckled. Mm. Harry, who was measuring out Podrid's spine of lionfish, ignored them. Malfoy had been even more unpleasant than usual since the Quidditch match, disgusted that the Slytherins had lost. He had tried to get everyone laughing at how a wide-mouthed tree frog would be replacing Harry as seeker next. Then he realized that nobody found this funny because they were also impressed at the way Harry had managed to stay on his fucking broomstick. So Malfoy, jealous and angry, had gone back to taunting Harry about having no proper family. It was true that Harry wasn't going back to private drive for Christmas. Professor McGonagall had come around the week before making a list of students who would be staying for the holidays and Harry had signed up at once. He didn't feel sorry for himself at all. This would probably be the best Christmas he'd ever had. Ron and his brothers were staying too because Mr. and Mrs. Weasley were going to Romania to visit Charlie. When they left the dungeons at the end of portions, they found a large fir tree blocking the corridor ahead. Two enormous feet sticking out at the bottom and a loud puffing sound told them that Hagrid was behind it. Hi, Hagrid, want any help? Ron asked, sticking his head through the branches. Ma'am, all right, thanks, Ron. Would you mind moving out of the way? Came Malfoy's cold roll from behind them. Are you trying to earn some extra money? <laughs> Weasley, hoping to be gamekeeper yourself when you leave Hogwarts, I suppose. That hut of Hagrid's must seem like a palace compared to what your family is used to. Ron died at Malfoy just as Snape came up the stairs. Weasley! Ron let go of the front of Malfoy's robes. He was provoked, Professor Snape said Hagrid, sticking his huge hairy face out from behind the tree. Malfoy was insulting his family. Be that as it may, fighting is against Hogwarts rules, Hagrid, said Snape. Silkily, five points from Gryffindor, busy, and be grateful it isn't more. Move along, all of you. Malfoy, Crab and Goy pushed roughly past the tree, scattering needles everywhere and smirking. I'll get him, said Ron, grinning his teeth at Malfoy's back. One of these days, I'll get him. I hate them both, said Harry, Malfoy and Snape. Come on, cheer up, it's nearly Christmas, said Hagrid. Tell you what, come with me and see the great hall looks at Trent. So the three of them followed Hagrid and his tree off to the great hall, where Professor McGonagall and Professor Flitwick were busy with the Christmas decorations. Ah, oh, Hagrid, the last tree, put it in the far corner, will you? The hall looked spectacular. Festoons of holly and mistletoe hung all around the walls, and no less than twelve towering Christmas trees stood around the room, some sparkling with tiny icicles, some glittering with hundreds of candles. How many days you got left until your holidays? Hagrid asked. Just one, said Hermione. And that reminds me, Harry Ron, you've got half an hour before lunch, we should be in the library. Oh yeah, you're right, said Ron, tearing his eyes away from Professor Flitwick, who had golden bubbles blossoming out of his wand and was trailing them over the branches of a new tree. 
the library said Hagrid, following them out of the hall. Just before the holidays, with Kim, aren't you? Oh, we're not working, Harry told him brightly. <laughs> Ever since you mentioned Nicholas Flannel, we've been trying to find out who he is. You what? Hagrid looked shocked. Listen here, I told you, drop it. It's nothing to you what that dog's garden. We just want to know who Nicholas Flannel is. That's all, said Hermione. Unless you'd like to tell us and say what's the trouble, he added. He must have been through hundreds of books already and we can find him anywhere. Just give us a hint. <laughs> I know I read his name somewhere. I'm saying nothing, said Harriet flatly. Just have to find out for ourselves then, said Ron. And they left Harriet looking disgruntled and hurried off to the library. They had indeed been searching books for Flamel's name ever since Harriet had let it slip. Because all else were they were they going to find out what Snape was trying to steal? The trouble was it was very hard to know where, where to begin. Not knowing what Flamel might have done to get himself into a book. He wasn't in great wizards of the 20th century or notable magical names of our time. To be Google York. He was missing two from important modern magical discoveries and a study of recent developments in wizardry. And then, of course, there was the sheer size of the library, tens of thousands of books, thousands of shelves, hundreds of narrow rows. Hermione took out a list of subjects and titles she had decided to search while Ron strode off down a row of books and started pulling them off the shelves at random. He wandered over to the restricted section. He had been wondering for a while if Flamel wasn't somewhere in there. Unfortunately, you needed a specially signed note from one of the teachers to look in any of the restricted books, and he knew he'd never get one. These were the books containing powerful dark magic never called in all words, and only read by older students studying advanced defense against the dark arts. What are you looking for, boy? Nothing, said Harry. Madame Pins, the librarian, brandished a feather duster at him. You'd, be, you'd better get out then. Go on. Out. Wishing he'd been a bit quicker at thinking up some story, he left the library. He, Ron, and Hermione had already agreed. They'd better not ask Madame Pins where they could find Flamel. They were sure she'd be able to tell them, but they couldn't risk Snape hearing what they were up to. He waited outside in the corridor to see if the other two had found anything. But he wasn't very helpful. Hopeful. They had been looking for two weeks after all, but as they only had odd moments between lessons, it wasn't surprising they'd found ain't nothing. What they really needed was a nice long search without Madame Pins breathing down their necks. Five minutes later, Ron and Hermione joined him, shaking their heads. They went off to lunch. You will keep looking while I am away, won't you? said Hermione. And send me an all if you find anything. And you could ask your parents if they know who Flamel is, said Ron. It would be safe to ask them, very safe, as they're both dentists and are winning. Once the holidays had started, Ron and Harry were having too good a time to think much about Flamel. They had the dormitory to themselves, and the common room was far emptier than usual, so they were able to get the good armchairs by the fire. They sat by the hour eating anything they could spear on a toasting fork, bread, English muffins, marshmallows, and plotting ways of getting Malfoy expelled, which were fun to talk about even if they wouldn't work. Ron also started teaching Harry Wizard chess. This was exactly like Muggle chess, except that the figures were alive, which made it a lot like directing troops in battle. Ron's set was very old and battered. Like everything else he owned, it had once belonged to someone else in his family, in this case, his grandfather. However, all chessmen weren't a drawback at all. Ron knew them so well he never had trouble getting them to do what he wanted. He replayed with chessmen Seamus Finnegan had lent him, and they didn't trust him at all. He wasn't a very good player yet, and they kept shooting different bits of advice at him, which was confusing. Don't send me there. Can't you see his knight? Send him. We can't afford to lose him. On Christmas Eve, he went to bed looking forward to the next day for the food and the fun, but not expecting any presents at all. When he woke early in the morning, however, the first thing he saw was a small pile of packages at the foot of his bed. Merry Christmas, said Ron sleepily as Harry scrambled out of bed and pulled on his bedrobe. You too, said Harry. Will you look at this? I've got some presents. 
What did you expect? Turnips, said Ron, turning to his own pile, which was a lot bigger than Hedy's. Hedy picked up the top parcel. It was wrapped, wrapped in thick brown paper and scrawled across it was to Hedy from Hagrid. Inside was a roughly cut wooden flute. Hagrid had obviously whittled it himself. Hedy blew it. It sounded a bit like an owl. A second very small parcel contained a note. We received your message and enclosed your Christmas present from Uncle Vernon and Aunt Petunia. Taped to the note was a 50 pence piece. That's friend, he said Hedy. Ron was fascinated by the 50 pence. Weird, he said. What a shame. This is money? You can keep it, said Hedy, laughing at how pleased Ron was. Have you then my aunt and uncle? So who sent this? I think I know who that was from, said Ron, turning a bit pink and pointing to a very lumpy parcel. My mom. I told her you didn't expect any presents and, oh no, he groaned. She's made you a Weasley sweater. He had torn open the parcel to find a thick hand-knitted sweater in emerald green and a large box of homemade fudge. Every year she makes us a sweater, said Ron, unwrapping his own, and mine's always maroon. It's really nice of her, said Harry, trying to fudge, which was very really tasty. His next present also contained candy, a large box of taco forks from Harmony. This only left one parcel. He picked it up and felt it. It was very light. He unwrapped it. Something fluid and silvery gray went slithering to the floor where it lay in gleaming folds. Ron gasped. I've heard of those, he said in a hushed voice dropping the box of every flavor beans it got from Harmony. If that's what I think it is, they are really rare and really valuable. What is it? Harry picked the shining silvery cloth off the floor. It was strange to the touch, like water woven into material. It's an invisibility cloak, said Ron. A look of A on his face. I'm sure it is. Try it on. He retrieved the cloak around his shoulders and Ron gave a yell. It is. Look down. He looked down at his feet, but they were gone. He dashed to the mirror. Sure enough, his reflection looked back at him. Just his head suspended in midair, his body completely invisible. Invisible, but invisible. He pulled the clock over his head, and his reflection vanished completely. There's a note, said Ron suddenly. A note fell out of it. Then he pulled off the clock and seized the letter. Written in narrow, loopy writing he had never seen before were the following words. Your father left this in my possession before he died. It's time it was returned to you. Use it well. A very Merry Christmas to you. There was no signature. Harry stared at the note. Ron was admiring the clock. I'd give anything for one of these, he said. Anything. What's the matter? Nothing, said Harry. He felt very strange. Who had sent the clock? Had it really once belonged to his father? Before he could say or think, Anything else, the dormitory door was flung open, and Fred and George visibly bounded in. He stuffed the clock quickly out of sight. He didn't feel like sharing it with anyone else yet. Merry Christmas. Hey, look, he's got a visa sweater, too. Fred and George were wearing blue sweaters, one with a large yellow F on it, the other a G. Harry's is better than ours, though, said Fred, holding up Harry's sweater. She obviously makes more of an... A fort, if you're not family. Why aren't you wearing yours Ron? George demanded. Come on, get it on. They're lovely and warm. I hate maroon, Ron moaned, half-heartedly as he pulled it over his head. You haven't got a letter on yours, George observed. I suppose she thinks you don't forget your name. But we're not stupid. We know we're called <laughs> Great <laughs> Porch. <laughs> that is that comic, yeah. What's all this noise? Percy Wizard stuck his head through the door, looking dis disapproving. He had clearly gotten halfway through unwrapping his presents as he too carried a lumpy sweater over his arm, which Fred sees it. P for Prefect. Get it on, Percy. Come on. We're all wearing ours. Even Harry got one. I don't want it, Harry, said Percy thickly as the twins forced the sweater over his head, knocking his glasses askew. And you're not sitting with the Prefects today either, said George. Christmas is a time for family. They frog marched Percy from the room, his arms pinned to his side by his sweater. And he had never in all his life had such a Christmas dinner. A hundred fat roast turkeys, mountains of roast and boiled potatoes, platters of chipolatas, 
trees of buttered peas, silver balls of teak, rich gravy and cranberry sauce, and stacks of wizard crackers every few feet along the table. These fantastic party favors were nothing like the feeble muggles ones the Dursleys usually both, with their little plastic toys and their flimsy paper hats inside. Harry pulled a wizard cracker with bread, and it didn't just bang. It went off with a blast like a cannon and engulfed them all in a cloud of blue smoke, while from the inside exploded their rear admiral's head and several live white mice. Live, live, live another. Up at the high table, Dumbledore had swept his pointed wizard's head for a flowered bonnet and was chuckling merrily at the joke Professor Flitwick had just written. Flaming Christmas pudding follow of the turkey. Person nearly broke his teeth on a silver sickle embedded in a slice. He watched Hagrid getting redder and redder in the face as he called for more wine, finally kissing Professor McGonagall on the cheek, who, to his amazement, giggled and blushed, her top head lopsided. When Harry finally left the table, he was laden down with a stack of things out of the crackers, including a pack of non-explodable luminous balloons, a grow your own wards kit, and his own new wizard chest set. The white mice had disappeared, and Harry had a nasty feeling they were going to end up as Mrs. Morris's Christmas dinner. Harry and the Weasley spent a half happy afternoon, having a furious snowball fight on the grounds. Then cold, wet, and gasping for breath, they returned to the fire in the Gryffindor common room, where Harry broke in his new chest set by losing spectacularly to Ron. He suspected he wouldn't have lost so badly if Percy hadn't tried to help him so much. After a meal of turkey sandwiches, crumpets, trifle, and Christmas cake, everyone felt too full and sleepy to do much before bed except sit and watch Percy chase Fred and George all over Gryffindor Tower because they had stolen his prefect beige. It had been Harry's best Christmas day ever, yet something had been nagging at the back of his mind all day. Not until he climbed into bed was he free to think about it, the invisibility, invisibility cloak, and whoever had sent it. One full of turkey and cake and with nothing mysterious to bother him, fell asleep almost as soon as he'd drawn the curtains of his poster. Harry leaned over the side of his own bed and pulled the clock out from under it. His father's, this had been his father's. He let the material flow over his hands, smothered and silk, light as air. Use it well, the note had said. Get to try it now. He slipped out of bed and wrapped the clock around himself. Looking down at his legs, he saw only moonlight and shadows. It was a very funny feeling. Use it well. Suddenly, he felt wide awake. The whole of Hogwarts was open to him in this clock. Excitement flowed through him as he stood there in the dark and silence. He could go anywhere in this, anywhere, and Fitch would never know. Ron grounded in his sleep. Should he wake him? Wake him, something held him back. His father's clock, he felt that this time, the first time, he wanted to use it alone. He crept out of the dormitory, down the stairs, across the common room, and climbed through the portrait hall. Who is there? Squawked. Squa squawked. The fat lady, he said nothing. He walked quickly down the corridor. Where should he go? He stopped, his heart racing and thought, and then it came to him the restricted section in the library. He'd be able to read as long as he liked, as long as it took to find out who Flamel was. He set off, throwing the invis invisibility cloak tied around him as he walked. Which kere yanlışlıkla söyledim, madem kelimeyi konuşalım. Invincibility, invincible, yenilmez gibi bir şey olması lazım. Aynen. Alt edilemez böyle. Tamamıyla güçlü gibi. The library was pitch black and very eerie. Harry lit a lamp to see his way along the rows of books. The lamp looked as if it was floating along in midair, and even though Harry could feel his arm supporting it, the sight gave him the creeps. The restricted section was right at the back of the library. Stepping carefully over the rope <coughs> that separated it, these books <coughs> from the rest of the library, he held up his lamp to read the titles. They didn't tell him much. Their peeling, faded gold letters spelled words in languages 
Yet you couldn't understand. Some had no title at all. One book had a dark stain on it that looked horrible like blood. The hairs on the back of Harry's neck prickled. Maybe he was imagining it, maybe not, but he thought a faint whispering was coming from the books, as though they knew someone was there who shouldn't be. He had to start somewhere, setting the lamp down carefully on the floor. He looked along the bottom shelf for an interesting looking book. A large black and silver volume caught his eye. He pulled it out with difficulty because it was very heavy and balancing it on his knee, let it fall open. A piercing, blood curling shriek split the silence. The book was screaming. Harry snapped it shut, but the shriek went on and on, one high arm broken, ear splitting note. He stumbled backward and knocked over his lamp, which went out, which went out at once. Panicking, he heard footsteps coming down the corridor outside. Stuffing the shriking book bag on the shelf, he ran for it. He passed Fitch in the doorway. Fitch's pale, wild eyes looked straight through him, and he slipped under Fitch's outstretched arm and streaked off up the corridor, the book shrieks still ringing in his ears. He came to a sudden halt in front of a tall suite of armor. He had been so busy getting away from the library, he hadn't paid attention to where he was going, perhaps because it was dark. He didn't recognize where he was at all. There was a suite of armor near the kitchens, he knew, but he must be five floors above there. You asked me to come directly to you, Professor, if anyone was wandering around at night and somebody's been in the library, restricted section. He felt the blood drain out of his face, wherever he was, which must know a shortcut because his soft, greasy voice was getting nearer and to his horror, it was Snape who replied. The restricted section? Well, they can't be far, we'll catch them. He stood rooted to the spot as Filch and Snape came around the corner ahead. They couldn't see him, of course, but it was a narrow corridor, and if they came much nearer, they'd knock right into him. The clock didn't stop him from being solid. He backed away as quietly as he could. A door stood ayar to his left. It was his only hope. He squeezed through it. A door stood ayar to his left. It was his only hope. He squeezed through it, holding his breath, trying not to move it. And to his relief, he managed to get inside the room without their noticing anything. They walked straight past. And he leaned against the wall, breathing deeply, listening to their footsteps dying away. That had been close, very close. It was a few seconds before he noticed anything about the room he had hidden in. It looked like an unused classroom. The dark shapes of desks and chairs were piled against the walls, and there was an upturned waste paper basket. But propped against the wall facing him was something that didn't look as if it belonged there. Something that looked as if someone had just put it there to keep it out of the way. It was a magnificent mirror, as high as the ceiling, with an ornate gold frame standing on two clawed feet. There was an inscription carved around the top, Erystra Efruoid Uberkafruoid on Voxi. Bunu tersen okuluyormuş bu şey heyecanlanın. Is uh, how no to your uh, dur. is how not you your face but your heart heart's desire is how not your face but your uh, heart's desire not your face but your heart's desire yüzünün değil kalbinin şeyi ya his panic fading now that there was no sound of Filch and Snape, he moved nearer to the mirror, wanting to look at himself but see no reflection again, he stepped in front of it. He had to clap his hands to his mouth to stop himself from screaming. He veered around, his heart was pounding far more furiously than when the book had screamed, for he had, not, for he had seen not only himself in the mirror, but the whole crowd of people standing right, right behind him. 
but the room was empty. Breathing very fast, he turned slowly back to the mirror that he was reflected in it, wide and scared looking, and there, reflected behind him, were at least ten others. He looked over his shoulder, but still no one was there, or were they all in wins invisible too? Was he in fact in a room full of invisible people and this mirror's trick, was it reflected them, invisible or not? He looked in the mirror again. A woman standing right behind his reflection was smiling at him and waving. He reached out a hand and felt the air behind him. If she was really there, he touched her. Their reflections were so close together, but he felt only air. She and the others existed only in the mirror. She was a very pretty woman. She had dark red hair and her eyes. Her eyes are just like mine, he told, edging a little closer to the glass. Bright green. Exactly the same shape, but then he noticed that she was crying, smiling, but crying at the same time. The tall, thin, black-haired man standing next to her put his arm around her. He wore glasses and his hair was very untidy. It stuck up at the back just as he is it. He was so close to the mirror now that his nose was nearly touching that of his reflection. Mom, he whispered, Dad? They just looked at him, smiling. And slowly he looked into the faces of the other people in the mirror and saw other pairs of green eyes like his, other noses like his, even a little old man who looked as though he had hit his nobly knees. He was looking at his family for the first time in his life. The potter smiled and waved at Harry and he stared hungrily back at them. His hands pressed flat against the glass as though he was hoping to fall right through it and reach them. He had a powerful kind of age inside him, half joy, half terrible sadness. Şuan dedem yine abi bayağı bir kaplı düşüyor şu söylenen şeyler. Böyle bayağı bir gözümden her şey canlandı falan. Bayağı bir kitabın içinde oldum bir şu an çekindim şu an. Niye bu kadar kitabın içine düştüm diye, niye bu kadar kendimi kaptırdım diye hafif kendime kızar gibi oldum falan işte. Harry Potter'ın büyüsü bu yani. Hani cidden kapıyor yani. How long he stood there, he didn't know. The reflections did not fade and he looked and looked and the distant noise brought him back to his senses. He couldn't stay here, he had to find his way back to bed. He tore his eyes away from his mother's face, whispered and come back and hurried from the room. You could have woken me up, said Ron Crossy. You can come tonight, I'm going back. I want to show you the mirror. I'd like to see your mom and dad, Ron said eagerly. And I want to see all your family, all the visits. You'll be able to show me your other brothers and everyone. You can see them any old time, said Ron. Just come round my house this summer. Anyway, maybe it only shows that people, shame about not finding flannel though. Have some bacon or something? Why aren't you eating anything? He couldn't eat. He had seen his parents and would be seeing them again tonight. He had almost forgotten about flannel. It didn't seem very important anymore. Who cared what the three-headed dog was guarding? What did it matter if Snape stole it, really? Are you all right, said Ron. You look odd. What Harry feared most was that he might not be able to find a mirror room again. With Ron covered in the clock, too, they had to walk much more slowly the next night. They tried retracing Harry's road from the library, wandering around the dark passageways for nearly an hour. I'm freezing, said Ron. Let's forget it and go back. No, Harry hissed. I know it's here somewhere. They passed the ghost of a tall witch gliding in the opposite direction, but saw no one else. Just as Ron started moaning that his feet were dead with cold, he spotted the suite of armor. It's here, just here. Yes. They pushed the door open. He dropped the cloak from around his shoulders and ran to the mirror. There they were. His mother and father beamed at the side of him. See, he whispered. I can't see anything. Look, look at them all. There are lots of them. I can only see you. Look in it properly. Go on. Stand where I am. He stepped aside, but with Ron in front of the mirror, he couldn't see his family anymore. Just Ron in his paisley pajamas. Rondo was staring transfixed at his image. Look at me, he said. Can you see all your family standing around you? No, I'm alone, but I'm different. I look older, and I'm head boy. What? I am... I am wearing the beige like Bill used to, and I am holding the horse cup and the quid quidditch cup. I am quidditch captain too. Ron tore his eyes away from this splendid sight to look excitedly at Harry. Do you think this mirror shows the future? 
For can it on my family are dead? Let me have another look. You had it to yourself all last night. Give me a bit more time. You're only holding the Quidditch cup. What's interesting about it? I want to see my parents. Don't push me. A sudden noise outside in the corridor put an end to their discussion. They hadn't realized how loudly they had been talking. Quick. From three o'clock back over them as the luminous eyes of Mrs. Norris came round the, co round the door. Ron and Harry stood quite still, both thinking the same thing. Did the clock work on cats? After what seemed an age, she turned and left. This isn't safe. She might have gone for Filch. I bet she heard us. Come on. And Ron pulled Harry out of the room. The snow still hadn't melted the next morning. Want to play chess? Harry said Ron. No. Why don't we go down and visit Hagrid? No, you go. I know what you're thinking about, Harry. That mirror. Don't go back tonight. Why not? I don't know. I just got a bad feeling about it. And anyway, you had too many close shaves already. Filch, Snape and Mrs. Norris are wandering around. So what if they can see you? What if they walk into you? What if you knock something over? You sound like Harmony. I'm serious, Harry. Don't go. But Harry only had one thought in his head, which was to get back in front of the mirror. And Ron wasn't going to stop him. That third night he found his way more quickly than before. He was walking so fast he knew he was making more noise than was wise, but he didn't meet anyone. And there were his mother and father smiling at him again, and one of his grandfathers nodding happily. He sank down to sit on the floor in front of the mirror. There was nothing to stop him from staying here all night with his family, nothing at all, except, so, back again, Harry. Harry felt as though his insides had turned to ice. He looked behind him. Sitting on one of the desks by the wall was none other than Albus Dumbledore. Harry must have walked straight past him, so desperate to get to the mirror he hadn't noticed him. I, I didn't see you, sir. Strange how nearsighted being invisible can make you, said Dumbledore. And Harry was relieved to see that he was smiling. So, said Dumbledore, slipping off the desk to sit on the floor with Harry. You, like hundreds before you, have discovered that the lies of the mirror of Erised, Erised. I didn't know it was called that, sir, but I expect you realize by now what it does. It, well, it shows me my family, and it showed your friend Ron himself as head boy. How did you know? I don't need a clock to become invisible, said Tamdor gently. Now, can you think what the mirror of Erised, Erised shows us all? He shook his head. Let me explain. The happiest man on earth will be able to use the mirror of Erizot like a normal mirror. That is, he would look into it and see himself exactly as he is. Does it help? Harry thought. Then he said slowly, it shows us what we want, whatever we want. Yes and no, said Tumblr quietly. It shows us nothing more or less than the deepest, most desperate desire of all hearts. You who have never known your family, see them standing around you. Ronald Weasley, who has always been overshadowed by his brothers, sees himself standing alone, the best of all of them. However, this mirror will give us neither knowledge or truth. Men have wasted away before it, entranced by what they have seen, or been driven mad, not knowing if what it shows is real or even possible. Jesus. Blur okurken ben acaba ne görürdüm diye düşünüyordum da birden ne göreceğimi anladığım gibi bir şey oldu. Böyle bayağı derinde bir resim olarak oluştu kafamın içinde şu an. Kafam geldi bundan dolayı. The mirror will be moved to a new home tomorrow, Harry. And I ask you not to go looking for it again. If you ever do run across it, you will now be prepared. It does not do to dwell on dreams and forget to live. Remember that now. Why don't you put that admirable clock back on and get off to bed? Harry stood up. Sir, Professor Dumbledore, can I ask you something? Obviously you just done so, Dumbledore smiled. You may ask me one more thing, however. What do you see when you look in the mirror? I, I see myself holding a pair of thick woolen socks. Harry stared. One can never have enough socks, said Dumbledore. Another Christmas has come and gone, and I didn't get a single pair. People will insist on giving me books. It was only when he was back in bed that it struck Harry that Dumbledore might not have been quite truthful. But then he thought, 
as it shows scabbers of his pillow, it had been quite a personal question. Ve Dumbledore senin ne gördüğünü biliyordu, Ron'un da ne gördüğünü biliyordu. Ve sen şimdi Dumbledore'a sorduğun sorunun personal olduğunu düşünerekten Harry hata ediyorsun. Şurada bir şeye ben bakacağım. If you ever do run across it, you will now be prepared. Sanki bu lafı edince Dumbledore bir şekilde biliyormuş gibi geldi bana. İleride ne olacağını kendisi planladığı için her şey Dumbledore. Unutmayın arkadaşlar. Dumbledore her şeyi yönetiyor. Her şeyi ayarlayan adam Dumbledore. Neyse bunu daha ayrıntılı konuşuruz.